Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, this is uh, our Heidelberg webinar for OCT in the diagnosis and management of glaucoma. My name is Tim Cole. I'm the clinical affairs manager for Heidelberg UK. In the background helping me this evening is Emily Malburn. She's head of the UK Academy team. So Emily and I are going to be um, hidden away in the background this evening um, while the presentation is, is, uh, is happening. So it's my pleasure this evening to introduce you all to Mr. Andrew Tatham. Um, now, Andrew is a consultant ophthalmolo ophthalmologist at the Princess Alexandra Eye Pavilion in Edinburgh, and he's an award-winning glaucoma and cataract surgeon with a special interest in vision correction cataract surgery and drop-free drop glaucoma treatments. So I'm going to leave you in Andrew's very capable hands um, for this session. But if you have any questions at all, as Andrew's going through his slides, if you're new to the uh, go to menu bar, um, Andrew, if we just flick to the next slide there, you can see these are the controls and the way we ask a question. So you basically can click the icon, the question icon there and type any questions you have for Andrew as he's going through his presentation. So I'm going to vanish in a moment and leave you in Andrew's hands. Um, but as I say, um, keep your questions coming in and we'll have time at the end for Q&A after Andrew's fabulous presentation. So thank you very much, Andrew, um, and take it away. Thanks. Thanks very much, Tim. Thanks to Emily for the invitation to take part in this webinar. And thanks to everyone for tuning in. Um, I hope you'll find the next hour or so interesting. And please do um, send in questions because we, we are going to give lots of time for questions um, throughout throughout the uh, the session. Um, so if we look at OCT, um, it's been with us now for almost 30 years. Um, this is actually the very first published image of the optic nerve head and retina in a human. And this was published um, in Science in 1991. And it's quite incredible, really, to, to look at the, the advances in OCT that have been made in those 30 years, um, because we can now have you know, high resolution spectral domain images of the anterior and posterior segment. And of course, we have OCT angiography as well, um, enabling us to visualize the, um, the retinal uh, vasculature. So OCT is, you know, can give us some amazing pictures, but how do we actually use it in practice? And I wanted to cover um, four uh, main questions today. Um, and the first is to look at the role of OCT in glaucoma diagnosis. And with that, we need to be very aware of potential pitfalls. Um, and I'm going to present you know, how I would look at OCT, how I interpret it, to try and avoid some of those pitfalls. Then we'll look at OCT for detecting progression. And that's linked to diagnosis because looking for progressive changes is, is part of the definition of glaucoma. Um, but it's also very useful in people who have established glaucoma looking for change over time. And then lastly, we're going to look at who should we be imaging, um, what should we, should we be imaging and how often should we be doing it? And perhaps that might have changed because of events over the last few months in terms of the coronavirus. Um, so let's kick off by looking at diagnosis. Um, so what's the role of OCT in glaucoma diagnosis? Well, it provides objective quantitative measurements to complement the eye examination. And I think the, the emphasis on being complementary to the tests that we already have is important because it can't completely replace them. And it's very important to interpret OCT in the light of information from other tests from history, from examination. If we use OCT, we can identify glaucoma at an earlier stage. And that's very important because the changes from glaucoma are irreversible, causes irreversible loss of vision. Using OCT, we can detect glaucoma before any visual loss, in fact. Um, it also provides a very useful baseline for looking for change over time. And most importantly, changes on OCT predict future functional losses. So although OCT is a surrogate, it provides a measure of the retinal nerve fiber layer of the macula. And patients aren't so interested in those measurements. What they're interested in is visual loss. But those measurements can help predict those who are at higher risk of visual 
So that's that's what I think can be the use use of OCT in diagnosis. So OCT is not helpful for everyone in terms of detecting glaucoma. So a patient like this, we don't really need OCT to tell us that this is glaucoma. This patient has risk factors, high pressure, thin corneas, their age, and they also have pseudoexfoliation. And about 50% of people with pseudoexfoliation develop glaucoma. And unfortunately, they have advanced changes to the optic nerve and the visual field. So in somebody like this, I think you know, OCT isn't really needed for diagnosis. It might still be useful for looking for progression, but it, this is perhaps a more common situation though. It's the patient who we see with suspicious appearing optic nerves um, in whom we question whether there is glaucoma. Um, and this person, um, the area that I would be particularly concerned about is the superior temporal rim of the left eye. And it looks as though there's definite bayonetting, this, this um, uh, bending of the, of the, of the vessels um, showing neuroretinal rim loss. Um, and this person's visual fields are low reliability. Um, this person has a fixation losses of 8 out of 10 in the left eye and 9 out of 10 in the right. And the right visual field has been replotted four times and it still hasn't really helped. And that is not an uncommon occurrence. Patients don't like doing visual fields. They're difficult to perform and they can be unreliable. Um, and in this sort of patient, imaging becomes very important. Um, inter interestingly, um, there is the suggestion of decreased sensitivity inferior nasally in this person, and that has structure and function correlation. It agrees with the findings of OCT. So here's the OCT of the left eye of this person, and we can flip back comparing the photo and the OCT finding. And that area we were sus sus uh, suspected might be abnormal, the superior temporal rim is confirmed as having retinal nerve fiber layer thinning in that location. So um, what the scan does, places a circle scan around the optic nerve head. Here is the circle scan stretched out with the RNFL segmented. And here is the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness compared to a normative database. So if the thickness is in the green, we're happy. But here we can see the black line, the RNFL thickness dips into the red. And if it enters the red zone, there's less than a 1% chance of the RNFL being of normal thickness compared to the normative database in this location. And it's the superior temporal uh, area that is uh, abnormal, um, which fits in with the, with the disc findings. On the right eye, again, we compare the photo and the OCT. And here, the OCT is more reassuring um, and it looks fairly normal. Certainly, the classification is normal. Um, however, um, the superior temporal RNFL perhaps is slightly thin. It does dip down into the yellow here. Um, and given the abnormality in the other eye, perhaps that's very early glaucoma, but probably a little bit too early to tell. Um, so that's looking at um, diagnosis um, and looking at RNFL, but we can of course also image the macula and the optic nerve head. And this can help us improve our diagnostic capabilities. So I've shown you an example of the retinal nerve fiber layer already. This is another example. So here we have the circle scan. Um, and this circle scan is um, at 3.5 millimeters away from the center of the um, optic disc or Brooks membrane opening, in fact, which I'll come on to in a moment, because it's very important where we center these sort of retinal nerve fiber layer scans, and they need to be centered in a consistent way so that we can look for change over time. Um, I'll come on to that in a little bit more detail later. Um, and um, so we can see that this person, um, their, their segmentation looks pretty good. There don't seem to be any errors in segmentation. And if we look at their RNFL plotted against the normative database, um, we can see that it's in the green most of the way along. But here um, it dips down into the red. And this is in the inferior temporal region. Um, and we can see that's highlighted on the, um, the, the classification plot here, um, showing that the inferior temporal has a less than 1% chance of being normal thickness compared to the normative database. Um, so RNFL. There's many studies looking at the ability of RNFL thickness measurements to differentiate glaucoma and healthy. And most of these are case control studies where you take a group of healthy patients or healthy participants and a group of patients with glaucoma and you do OCT on both and then you see how well it differentiates them. Um, and the way that we look at the performance of the test is using the area under the curve. So an area under the curve of one is perfect. It differentiates them every time 
exactly right. An area under the curve of 0 0.5 means it's useless. It's uh, like tossing a coin completely random. And we can see that most of the studies give an area under the curve of about 0.9 or above. It seems to do very, very well. Though we have to be careful when we interpret these studies because many include patients with quite severe disease. So here, a mean deviation of minus 10, minus 5.9. So these are patients who have you no know, definite visual field loss, more like that first example, perhaps, where we would expect any test to be very good at detecting disease because these patients have very bad disease. And perhaps what's more important is to look at the ability of OCT to detect early disease. Those patients where it's difficult as clinicians for us to detect the disease. So you can see that there are studies further down in this table where the mean deviation is actually very close to normal pre-parametrical coma. And still, the RNFL thickness measurements perform well. Now, these studies, though, they, they are case control studies. They do exclude some unusual eyes, you know, high myopes, patients with funny looking optic nerves. So um, real world performance is likely to be a little lower. Um, and also in the real world, people over rely on using the normative database. Um, and there are some studies looking at how well does a normative database perform? How well do these classifications perform? And um, one of the problems in all these studies is what do you choose as your reference standard? How, what's your gold standard of glaucoma diagnosis if you're not allowed to use OCT? And um, one study, a very important study, was called the Glaucoma Automated Test Evaluation, or the GATE study. And this used the reference standard of diagnosis of glaucoma by a glaucoma expert, not using OCT. And they, it was a very sort of pragmatic real world study where they had almost a thousand patients who were referred to, from um, community optometrists to hospital because of a suspected glaucoma or hypertension. And they found the area under the curve was 0 0.8. So it's still pretty good, but not as good as those case control studies. What does this actually mean though? What, how, what does an area under the curve mean? Well, when, when you think about it in terms of missed diagnosis of glaucoma and forced positives, it's not quite so good because this means basically that if you relied on the RNFL classification, the global classification alone, you'd actually miss 20% of glaucoma and 20% false positives. So the message from this really is don't rely on the global classification alone. You need to look at the whole scan. Um, now, what about if you look at another reference standard? And this study was very, it's very interesting because they looked at glaucoma suspects who developed a visual field defect over two years of follow-up. So they defined glaucoma according to progressive changes. And these are the patients we're most worried about, the patients who are going to lose visual fields. So they had patients who were either healthy, um, had ocular hypertension or glaucoma suspects at baseline. And they took baseline OCT, and then they looked at how well the normative database could determine who, which of the glaucoma suspects developed field defects. That makes sense. And apologies for this quite complex table here, but basically the key message of the study was that the normative databases were very good at identifying healthy eyes. They had a very high specificity, but the sensitivity was slightly lower. And they, if the, they had 34 patients who developed visual field damage over these two years. And the sensitivity of the global RNFL being outside normal limits was about 25 to 33% using different OCT devices. But the message was that rather than using the global RNFL, if you looked at one RNFL sector outside normal limits, the sensitivity was higher. And I think it's quite impressive, actually, that there was a 50 percent. They identified 50 percent of the patients who had glaucoma suspect at baseline who went on to develop visual field loss. But they're the patients we most worry about. Um, so what about the macula? That's RNFL. And macula is very important. And you might think, well, glaucoma is a disease of the optic nerve. Why, why worry about the macula? Well, the macula is really important for central vision um, and um, it, it houses um, a lot of retinal ganglion cells. So although it accounts for 2% of retinal area, it has about 30% of retinal ganglion cells. Also, optic nerves vary considerably between normal people, but macula tend to vary less. There's more inter individual um, consistency. And the macula, although we tend to think of glaucoma as affecting peripheral vision first, that isn't the case. It often affects central vision first. It's just that we haven't been looking for it. Um, and when we look at macular changes, 
we can see that they can occur quite early on in glaucoma. Um, there was a recent Cochrane review which looked at um, uh, studies comparing the retinal nerve fiber layer and macular OCT for detecting glaucoma. And their conclusion was actually macular parameters perform very similarly to RNFL parameters. Um, but RNFL is probably slightly better. They also concluded that if you use macular scans, you'll detect damage in some eyes that are missed on RNFL and vice versa. So if we want to um, increase the sensitivity with which we detect glaucoma, um, we could, should really use both. We might have slightly more false positives, however. Um, and now um, we can look at the whole retina um, in terms of the macula. We can, we can look at different layers of the macula. And that can give us a clue as to whether the pathology is due to glaucoma or not. And I'm going to show you some examples where it's not glaucoma later. But I think it's very useful to have the ability to look at whole retinal thickness. So here's an example where there is an arcuate defect in the whole retinal thickness here, inferiorly. This is a thickness map showing the absolute thickness. This is a thickness deviation map, which confirms this area is abnormal. So the red regions here correspond to a less than 1% chance that the thickness of the whole retina is normal in that location. And then we also have a classification chart, but this looks at the central uh, macula. So it's normal because it's outside, the abnormality is outside of this area. Then we can look at the same eye and we can tell that the reason that the retina is thinned is due to loss of retinal nerve fiber layer. So here's that defect and the area of abnormality and we can also look at the ganglion cell layer in the same eye. And the ganglion cell layer is thickest. It forms like a donut shape in the macula, um, a ring donut. And we can see that there's a bite has been taken out of this donut inferior temporally. And we can see that on the thickness deviation map. And the ganglion cell layer is where the ganglion cell bodies are. So the thin in here is basically the, the ganglion cell um, bodies of the axons, which are thinned in the RNFL plot. So it's very helpful to be able to look at the different layers and um, to look at the location of damage. So we've mentioned the RNFL, we've mentioned the macula. What about the optic nerve head? And the optic nerve head, of course, is what we've looked at for the longest amount of time in glaucoma. We've looked at cup disc ratios, we've looked at rim area, um, and um, we kind of abandoned the optic nerve head by moving to RNFL, but that was a mistake because the optic nerve head is important. Um, and recently, there's um, been um, a growing realization that the, using the disc margin as a landmark is not ideal. So if each of us were to draw where we think the margin of the optic disc is on a photograph, we would all draw in slightly different locations. And if we used OCT, it wouldn't really help us because it doesn't correspond to an anatomical landmark on OCT. Um, and that's a problem because you know, if we're looking at a parameter like cup disc ratio, we're using the disc margin as our landmark. But that could be very different between different people. So what is more helpful is to look at a consistent landmark that we can identify on OCT. And that is the Brooks membrane opening. So that's the termination of Brooks membrane. And if we take um, radial OCT scans through the optic nerve head, we can identify the termination of Brooks membrane in each of those scans and then look at the distance from the termination of Brooks membrane to the internal limiting membrane, which is it's basically a variation of measuring the rim thickness or the rim, the rim area, if you like, um, but using a more consistent way. And um, by looking at the minimum rim width, this is that is the the minimum distance, sorry, I'll just go back, the minimum distance um, in those um, serial scans. We can identify um, that it has a very high uh, sensitivity for detecting glaucoma. Um, so we now have um, normative databases for minimum rim width, very much like we do for retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. And if we look at the green line in this, this upper scan here, this is the normal um, minimum rim width uh, thickness. Uh, um, and we can see there's a sort of a gentle double hump. Um, and this person, uh, they have um, abnormality, this person has glaucoma, so we can see that their uh, minimum wind width is reduced in these, these locations. Um, and we can look at uh, classification as well. Um, so the black, the dark black arrow here 
has been flagged as outside normal limits on the, the, the classification, a less than 1% chance that the minimum wind width is normal in this location. And interestingly, although this area is clearly abnormal, it hasn't quite reached the threshold for being flagged as abnormal uh, in the classification. So there's a 7% chance that this is, is normal. Um, so I think that again illustrates to look at the whole scan, not just looking at these sort of pie charts. So I think that, that covers um, a little bit of the role of OCT in glaucoma diagnosis. It covers um, the, some of the structures we can look at, but what are the potential pitfalls? Um, well, I think rather than highlight pitfalls, what we should do is look at a systematic approach for interpreting OCT. And um, these are my sort of seven tips, if you like, for how I approach an OCT. And what I'll do is go through each of them in turn. So firstly, it's very important to look at scan quality, the alignment of the scan and the segmentation. As I showed you a little bit of that, as, as I talked through the, the previous example, but artifact is still a problem. Scan alignment is still a problem. Segmentation errors are still a problem, but they are becoming less of a problem as, as the software improves. Um, and this isn't the latest version of um, the Spectralis software, but um, uh, no, uh, this was from 2015, that they found artifact in 46% of scans. Um, the main cause was decentration, and that has been um, overcome slightly by using Brooks membrane as a landmark for placing the RNFL scan. Um, other problems are error associated with posterior vitreous detachment. I was surprised that was so frequent, actually. I don't see that that much in clinical practice. Um, but then segmentation errors, poor signal. You can see that there are there are a wide range of different um, uh, reasons that can be errors. And errors are more common in people with funny optic nerves. So people like this who has a very tilted myopic optic nerve where OCT of the nerve head really isn't very useful. Certainly the segmentation isn't very useful. In someone like this, macular scans are likely to be more of more value. So here's an example of um, one of the few cases I've seen where with that uh, second most common cause, an error associated with posterior vitreous detachment. So this is a um, this person has vitreoretinal traction, which is causing elevation of the uh, RNFL. And um, this person also has glaucoma. So you can see they have a very thin superior temporal rim, and the RNFL is very thin in that corresponding location. And that shows here on, on the map. But next to the thin area is a very fat area. Um, and um, that's because of the, the traction. So always look out for that. Here's another er error. So this is somebody who has um, an epiretinal membrane. And we can see as we check the segmentation that the segmentation has been tricked and it follows the epiretinal membrane rather than the RNFL. And um, this person, it, this wasn't actually identified at this baseline visit. And they came for a follow up visit. And we wondered, you know, have they progressed? Because this sector has dropped, you know, the superior temporal sector has dropped from 101 microns down to 79 microns. And um, it looks as though the, the thickness of the RNFL has really dropped, but it hasn't. It's just that the, the algorithm has actually worked correctly this time um, and it hasn't included the epiretinal membrane. But you can manually correct this. Interestingly, over here, look, it has included the epiretinal membrane. So it's always important to check segmentation. Um, the second point is uh, always look at the whole scan. Don't just rely on the, um, the, the, the overall classification because one, one important reason is that the classification may not show the full extent of damage. So in someone like this, once it becomes red, it doesn't become red -er. So you can't see progression. Um, so don't, don't look at this for progression. Also, once it becomes red, you know, it doesn't give you any indication of just how severe the loss is. So, um, no, this person, you can really see when you look at the, the, the scan, how thin the RNFL is in that location. So important not to just look at the scan for that reason. And this is the, that same person. And once we do a macular scan, I think that gives us a, you know, a greater appreciation for just how much tissue they have lost. Um, the second reason not to look at the whole scan, I think, is that focal defects may not be sufficiently large enough to be classified as outside normal limits. Um, so here's an example of a person who's everything is green. Green means good, but does it because it does look as though the INFL dips down near to the red zone here. Mm -hmm. And if we do the macular scan, um, we can see that there is um, substantial um, loss of retinal tissue. Um, and that is actually the, uh, uh, the fellow eye to somebody I showed, showed you earlier. So don't, don't just look at the, 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 the overall classification. Third point is, Think about the normative database. Is it actually appropriate for the patient? 
Um, so if you've got a high myo, it probably doesn't make too much sense to compare them to a normative database that doesn't include high myopia. And they, the, the databases do not include high myopia. Um, and myopes are a particular problem, perhaps something we can discuss at, at the end. But there's, they often have false positives on OCT, which is known as red disease because of funny optic nerves. The other important point about myopes is that when we're looking at the thickness plot, there's normally that peak, the, the, the um, peak in thickness, which corresponds to where the um, arcuate RNFL is and the blood vessels. And the position of those, those blood vessels varies. So in myopes, they are, there is temporal displacement. So the arcuate fibers and the blood vessels tend to be closer together. And what that does is affect the position of the peaks. And if you're comparing it to a normative database that hasn't had their peaks adjusted, you can have it falsely classified as outside normal limits. Um, fourth point is to compare the RNFL macula. So actually, this was the example I showed you before, the person with um, uh, very mild changes on RNFL, the macular scanning has you know, gross abnormality. The fifth point, I think, is looking where the damage is. And I'd like to call these points glaucoma hotspots. So there are certain regions where change is, from glaucoma is more likely. So that's inferior temporal and superior temporal RNFL. So if you've got change in the nasal RNFL and not in the inferior temporal and superior temporal RNFL, probably not glaucoma. Um, and if we're looking at the macula, there's a region of the macula known as the macular vulnerability zone which is the inferior temporal macula. So changes in, in that part of the macula and the inferior temporal superior temporal RNFL, they are the glaucoma hotspots. And um, using these, the, the, the macula OCT and looking at the level of involvement, as I showed you before, can be very helpful with that. Skip through that. The sixth important point is to look for agreement with changes on perimetry. So don't interpret the OCT in isolation. See, is there structure and function agreement? And when we're trying to diagnose glaucoma, there, sh there should be. Um, but because the changes in OCT can happen first, there isn't always. Um, and we have new tools that can help us do this, such as the Hood Report. And Don Hood um, in uh, New York um, is an optometrist who has done a lot of work really changing how we look at OCT. And one of the most important things that he's done is um, has changed the, 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 the plot that we use. So we used to use the, um, a T-SNP plot. So the, basically the order of the regions of the, um, uh, the peripapillary um, RNFL uh, has been changed. Because the, from, if you remember from the glaucoma hotspots, it's the temporal RNFL that's most commonly affected. So we want the temporal tissue in the center of attention. So rather than having T-SNP plots, we've now moved to N-SNP plots. So that's one important innovation. But the other is to be able to plot um, the location of visual field test points over the OCT to combine the information. So this shows the 24-2 test points and the 10-2 test points. So that can be really helpful. The seventh point is don't rely on OCT. Um, always consider other pathology. So Glaucoma really is a diagnosis of exclusion. We need to always think about other non glaucomatous optic neuropathies, about other ocular diseases, about neurological disease. And here's an example. So, this person has change in what I would call a glaucoma not spot. So, this person has um, you know, very um, localized um, changes in, in the macular um, thickness. And um, this is not at all a, a, sort of a pattern that's typical of glaucoma. Um, you know, it's, it's a binasal um, thinning of the retina. And binasal thinning of the retina will give you a bitemporal visual field defect. So this person actually has um, a lesion of the, the, the chiasm. So you know, looking at the location of damage can be very, very important in, term, in determining the cause. Here's another example. Um, so again, this is not glaucoma. Um, so this is a, a person who has slightly high pressure. Um, and they have got a field defect, and this could be a glaucomatous field defect. But, and if we just looked at the classification, we might say, oh yes, inferior temporal thinning um, fits with the field, okay, that's glaucoma. But look at the, the thickening that's present also. This person has very, so we have to remember RNFL can get thicker as well as thinner. 
And um, you, know, you can see that the disc isn't cut. It's, it, it, there is thickening of the tissue. And this was the other eye, which was also thickened. So what was wrong with this person? Um, again, a scan was performed. And this person has thyroid eye disease. So that they have a compressive optic nerve problem because their extraocular muscles are so enlarged, they're compressing the optic nerve, causing swelling of the optic nerve and thickening of the RNFL. So don't interpret OCT in isolation. And this is the OCT after this person wasn't treated with latanoprost, they were treated with um, oral steroids for, for their thyroid eye disease. And we can see that um, there's the, the RNFL returns to an, a reasonable thickness. But interestingly, there is actually thinning of the RNFL now because they've got an optic neuropathy. Um, here's another example. I think it's the last example of non-glaucomatous optic neuropathy. Um, uh, so this, again, is not glaucoma, um, but it might be misinterpreted as being glaucoma. So this, this person has an um, a, um, altitudinal visual field defect in the left eye, and they're actually aware that they have a problem, and the field in the other eye was normal. Um, here is the OCT. So there, there is um, thinning in the glaucoma hotspots, inferior temporal, superior temporal. Um, but here is where a macular OCT, again, can be very useful. So total retinal thickness is reduced inferiorly, and that fits with the superior field loss. And there is thinning of the ganglion cell in the flexible main. But critically, and it is very helpful to look at this layer too, the inner nuclear layer is also thinned. And an OCT angiography, there's um, decreased perfusion inferiorly. It's very striking. But why is the inner nuclear layer important? because it can help us differentiate ischemia from optic neuropathies. Um, so optic neuropathies affect the ganglion cell layer, the retinal nerve fiber layer, the ganglion cell layer, and the inner plexiform layer. So those three layers, those three innermost layers, but they don't affect the inner nuclear layer to the same extent. So it's useful to look for that because it might point to an ischemic cause. So that's um, my seven points to how I would approach an OCT interpretation. Um, so next we can look at progression. And I think that we don't need to spend quite so much time on progression um, because I think a lot of you are optometrists, you may not be, you're probably more interested in detecting the disease rather than following it up. But I think it's important to look at because it does help us with diagnosis as well. So what are the reasons to detect progression? Well, one is to try and work out what is the risk that this person has of losing vision. And although OCT is not actually measuring vision, it is a very useful surrogate because it changes often before vision changes. Also, it's very useful to determine if treatment is effective. And lastly, I've mentioned it can help us diagnose early disease. So there are many patients who have suspicious optic nerve appearance where, you know, I'm referred to patients all the time, um, has this person got Coma, they've got a suspicious appearance of optic nerve. And a lot of the time, I don't know. We don't always have the answers, but looking for change over time is then key. And OCT can be very useful. Um, how do we look at progression? Well, we can look at it in terms of trend analysis or event analysis. I'll show you trend analysis in a moment. That's looking at sort of rates of change over time. I, the way I look at it is, again, to look at the, um, the T-SNP plot. To look here, the black line shows the, the current visit scan and the light gray scan, the great light gray line, that's the baseline scan. So you can see that there is a significant decrease in INFL thickness really across the board. And so that looks, that's very highly suggestive of progression. But we can't look at that line on its own, as I showed you before, that example of segmentation error. We need to look for um, you know, the segmentation of each of those scans. So I think actually putting the two, the baseline and the most recent scan, one above the other, and actually comparing them is also very, very useful. I also like to, um, you know, you have the capability to also play a, a little movie showing the, the, the scan. Um, and, and you can actually see here, let's play that again if I can. You can see here the, where there's progression. There's RNFL is decreasing in thickness in that location. Um, the other way is trend analysis, so uh, plotting the thickness here over time and working out the rate of change. So this person is losing 3.7 microns per year. Oh, come on, is that, is that a lot? Is that, is that important? I think let's, let's comment on that in a moment. 
but it is a, it's a significant downward slope. So we have enough scans here to be able to determine that that person has a significant rate of loss. So that's very useful and it helps us then predict where that person might be in a few years. So, so looking at trend analysis is important. And you can look at trend analysis globally and in each of the sectors as well. So how do we approach progression analysis? Again, it's important to have a systematic approach and it's very similar to the approach for diagnosis. So again, check scan quality, alignment, segmentation in all of the scans. Look at the whole scan, don't rely on average thickness. Look for the change in the glaucoma hotspots. So the same hotspots that, affect, that are useful for diagnosis, they're the hotspots that tend to change with progression. Again, look for agreement with changes on perimetry. But here there's a slight catch, a slight difference, because whereas for diagnosis, we expect agreement, we expect um, visual fields and OCT to agree, Often in progression, they don't. It's actually quite unusual for someone to be progressing on visual fields and on OCT at the same time. And that's because of the, the way they measure things. It's not because they're, they're not, they, they both measure ganglion cell loss, but they measure it in different ways. Um, also, don't rely on the OCT alone. If someone's progressing, particularly if their pressure is normal, always think, is there something else going on? Is there another pathology? And it's also important to consider, is it change we actually need to worry about? Is it statistically or clinically significant? I'm going to mention the difference in a moment. So when we're trying to look for um, progression, there are some things that are important. There's five points. So the first is we need good image registration. Now we need to make sure we're scanning the same point, point in the eye every time. So to do that, eye tracking is very, very helpful. And using a stable landmark like Brooks Membrane Open. So um, there's a lot of variation, actually, in the alignment of the optic nerve head and the fovea. And that affects, of course, the normative database and where those peaks are. Uh, um, so that, it's important that we scan the same point. Also, the second point is the change, to detect change over time, the scans need to be reproducible. And average RNFL thickness has a, an intervisit variability of about four to five microns. So we need change of about of more than four microns for it to be significant. However, Using these new tools, these ways to ensure we scan the same point every time, like Brooks Membrane Opening, the, the reproducibility is improved. So whereas having you know, previous studies have shown a four micron reproducibility, some recent studies have shown it can be as low as one micron. And that's very important for detecting change. I'll come on to why in just a second. Um, eye tracking is also a feature that improves reproducibility. And there was a recent study that actually looked at the reproducibility of OCT measurements with and without eye tracking being on. And they found that it was significantly better. So the coefficient of variance reduced from 2.7 to 1.3 when you turn an eye tracker on. Um, next, we need a useful dynamic range. And um, to, uh, it's helpful here to consider um, a, a staircase or a ladder with a ceiling and a floor. So if we think about the ceiling first, this is the normal eye, the normal RNFL thickness. One of the problems here is that there's a wide range of normal RNFL thickness. And because of this, you know, if somebody starts well into the white here, they could potentially lose about a third of their RNFL before they drop down into the yellow or red. So when we're looking for change over time, we can't, again, it can't, I've said it a lot, but don't rely on the, on the color coded classification because you can lose a third of your RNFL and still be in the white or, or, or classified as normal, normal thickness. Now, that's the ceiling, but there's also a floor in measurements as well. And that's around about 40 microns. So the average RNFL thickness doesn't tend to go below about 40 microns. Um, there's lots of different reasons for that. One is because we're also measuring things like blood vessels. Um, so there, there's non-neural tissue. So that will create a floor. So that's important. So if you're, if you're looking for progression on OCT and the average thickness is already 40 microns, you're not going to see progression. And that might lower, uh, you, might, you know, might have a full sense of security that someone's not progressing because they're at 40 microns. Visual field is going to be far more helpful. Um, the floor in RNFL measurement um, actually occurs at quite a, quite a, a um, high um, a visual field uh, mean deviation, so um, about minus 15 decibels. But there is large variation between individuals. 
Um, so the, the ceiling and floor is important, but the number of steps is also important. So here we go back to reproducibility. So if your scan has a five micron reproducibility, then you've only got a very limited number of steps that you can actually confidently detect changes. Um, so improving the reproducibility is really important to be able to better detect change and have a greater number of steps. So um, if we think about our ceiling and flooring measurements, um, our dynamic range is only about 50 to 60 microns, and that would only give us 10 steps if our reproducibility was 5 microns. But if we reduce our reproducibility, or improved it, sorry, to 1 micron, then um, our dynamic range of 50 to 60 would actually give us 50 to 60 steps for detecting change. So it's really important, that, and, and these tools to improve the reproducibility are, are very encouraging. Um, macular measurements may also be helpful. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll perhaps skip through a little bit of this, but um, macular measurements might actually be more useful in advanced disease. They might have a lower floor than RNFL. A couple of studies have suggested that recently. I'll skip through that as well, actually. I want to leave more time for questions. So the next important point, I think, is we need to have an agreed definition of progression. And actually, we still, we still don't. There is still debate and lack of consensus about you know, how much progression on OCT is important. But um, what constitutes significant progression? Well, it can be statistically significant. So if we're using an event-based analysis, that's change from baseline that exceeds the limits of variability. So if our reproducibility is four microns, change greater than four, it might be um, statistically significant on an event-based analysis. Um, and then on a trend-based analysis, we can define it different ways. So the simplest way is to say, you've got a statistically significant downward slope. So you're losing RNFL over time. That's the simplest way to do it, but it's not a very good way to do it because we also lose RNFL with age. Um, and so it's very important to take account of aging um, when we're trying to work out whether someone is uh, getting worse over time. Um, and age-related loss, um, these are some figures. So um, it's a little bit depressing, isn't it, to think that you know, each year we're losing actually about 0.5 microns of our RNFL as we get older. Um, and here are some sort of similar changes with the, the macular and um, box membrane opening minimum room width measurements. So that's the average though, but if you look at the chart here, you can see that there's quite a wide range and 5% of people lose 0.9 microns per year. So um, because of this age-related change, if we don't take that into account, actually eventually everyone would be forcefully labeled as progressive, even if you don't have glaucoma. And in this study, they looked at four years follow-up and they found um, that these, these were in, um, uh, uh, patients uh, followed up with OCT every six months. But over four years, they found that 27% progressed if you um, didn't take account of age. Um, and as, as, uh, I think that's actually a long figure. It was less anyway with RNFL. Um, so um, th there's also a very interesting study recently which looked at different definitions. Of, you know, how should we define significant progression? And they used four different definitions. One was just a significant negative slope. And then they said a significant um, negative slope, which was um, below sort of the expected of, of, of their population. And then they looked at, uh, you know, for age, and then they looked at um, the, the slope, um, which was um, outside of the 95% confidence interval. And uh, basically they showed that, that you know, this black line, the solid black line showed that after 14 years, 90% of healthy people would be labeled as progressive, progressive if you didn't take account of age. Um, so that's um, the statistically significant progression, but also clinically significant progression is, is perhaps more relevant. That's what really matters to patients. And that is very hard to define as well, because it depends on the individual, depends on their life expectancy, their other eye, um, their occupation. So, so I think that's very much uh, an individualized um, assessment for, for each patient. Um, just um, a month or two ago, there was an interesting study looking at the real world rates of RNFL loss. Um, we've had several studies looking at visual field loss, um, but this is the, the first and the largest um, which has looked at OCT change in a real world population. And they had an incredible 60,000 OCT tests in their study of almost 8,000 patients. And these are patients with glaucoma who were on treatment. And they found even on treatment, the average rate of change was 
um, 0.68 microns per year, so slightly faster than age-related loss. But very interestingly, they found that each one millimeter higher intraocular pressure during the follow-up period was associated with a 0.05 micron per year faster rate of RNFL loss. And um, we don't really have any agreed definitions on, on um, you know, how on slow, moderate, and fast rates of RNFL loss, but they proposed that one micron per year was slow, between one and two microns per year was moderate, and more than two microns per year was fast. Um, so here's an example of somebody um, looking at progression. So this was a, a patient from my clinic um, who had um, peak pressures of 25 and 26, slightly thick corneas, pressures that have come down to 19 on treatment. And this was their baseline um, fo photos and OCT. Um, so they have superior temporal RNFL thinning. And um, again, um, it seems as though all my patients have unreliable visual fields, but his visual fields are not very reliable, weren't very useful for actually detecting change. Um, but if we look at his RNFL over time, we've only got four um, scans here. So we haven't got enough to actually give us a slope or a p-value. Another one would. Um, but this was making me worry. This you know, was really, it looks as though he has a very fast rate of decline. So this is very valuable information, um, considering that his, uh, his visual fields are of low reliability. And it, it certainly made me adjust my target pressure to try and get the pressure down lower. Um, and this shows the change in the um, different regions as well. So the rate of change really does look as though it's very rapid. Um, and here is the, um, the, the two um, T-SNP plots showing the baseline and most recent visit. So OCT can be very useful for, for looking at change in, in these sort of patients. There are pros and cons for using OCT for progression analysis. Um, and you no, know, it is objective. It's very easy to obtain multiple tests. It's very quick. And um, it's very suited to telemedicine as well. I think with virtual clinics, there's an increasing important role for OCT. And, and I think with um, the change in how we, do, how, how we cope with um, clinics in terms of coronavirus, um, there's an increasing role for OCT there, particularly with you know, concerns about prolonged visual field testing. Um, and also another plus is you can simultaneously test for macular disease. But there are negatives. We've mentioned it is a surrogate. There is a floor effect. Um, I think you need to look at the raw images. You shouldn't you know, use OCT in place of visual fields. Um, don't abandon visual field testing. It is really still the most important test, I would say. Um, and there's still lack of evidence about an, um, the optimal testing frequency or an agreed definition of progression. But hopefully what I've shown you gives you some sort of insight into that. So lastly, who, what, and how often should we image? And this is a very short uh, slide. I think, I think um, for me, it's most useful in early disease, in ocular hypertension and glaucoma suspects. That's really where OCD is, is irreplaceable. It's also very useful in the fellow eyes of patients who have glaucoma in the other eye. Because you, you know, if somebody has field loss in one eye, you can monitor their other eye very closely with OCT. I think progression analysis is also very, very useful in unusual eyes. So we've, I showed you the example of a high myope where you know, the, the, for diagnostic purposes, it's not so helpful. But it's still useful for progression because that person will stay a high myope. You can look for progressive changes and it can still be useful in advanced disease. Um, there is most evidence for progression analysis using RNFL. So if you're going to choose one parameter to so look for change over time, look at RNFL. But macular measurements may have a lower floor. And I've mentioned there is lack of consensus on optimal frequency, but it makes sense to do it more often in those at high risk. And coronavirus is certainly likely to lead to an increase in images. So we've covered a lot of ground there, um, four basic questions, and hopefully you've learned something from it. Um, and um, I think the, mo the key sort of take home message really is have a systematic approach. Um, so I'll leave you with those seven points. And um, if you do, if there are any questions have been submitted, um, perhaps we can take some time to try and answer them. Andrew, thank you so much. Um, yeah, we've got a ton of questions. Emily and I have been busy in the background uh, trying to answer, answer as many as we can, but we've left some of the uh, the more challenging ones, the more clinical ones uh, for you to answer, if that's okay with you. Yeah. Um, so I think for the sake of time, I'll just dive right in, I think, and, and read some of these questions to you. So um, the first question is, one of the theories why glaucoma starts um, 
it says that some levels of ischemia might be happening in the neuronal layer. So taking this into account in, the, in a nuclear layer trick, would you consider this trick reliable? Is there any invest, investigation in this line you might advise us to look at? Um, I was just going to say, I think that that was it was one of my neuro ophthalmology colleagues who taught me that trick. And um, I think he, he I think it's very useful. He was applying it to uh, non glaucomatous optic neuropathies. So you know, optic atrophies. And um, um, uh, but um, it does apply to glaucoma, too. And, but I, I think it is correct to highlight that glaucoma is not all about intraocular pressure. There is a vascular element to glaucoma. Um, and. Um, but I don't think that, you know, certainly people have looked at OCT angiography in glaucoma as well and shown that there's reduced fat vessel dense, density um, in, in glaucoma. But um, I so, so I don't think I don't think it's a concrete rule. Um, I'm not aware of any studies that have looked at the you know, specificity and sensitivity of imaging the in a nuclear layer you know, in differentiating mm -hmm. these diseases. So I, I think um, as with everything, it's one piece of the jigsaw puzzle. Um, yeah. It would be, I think it's very unusual to see, um, certainly in my experience, I, I haven't seen many patients, even with advanced glaucoma, have marked thinning of the inner nuclear layer. Um, um, but, but no, it's a good, I think it's a good point. Um, and it would be nice to see more studies actually uh, you know, investigating that. Yeah, great. Okay, actually, you've, you've partly um, glanced over the next question I have, actually. So, um, this is a question um, relating to OCT angiography, and someone has asked, um, do you think OCT angiography offers a potential for detecting glaucoma early and follow up through the assessment of the capillary uh, perfusion of the inner optic nerve head? What's, what's your take on OCTA then, Andrew? Well, based, based on the um, current data, I would say no. It's certainly not. I would certainly not recommend using OCT angiography in clinical practice for glaucoma. I right. think it's very, very useful for retina, um, um, but for glaucoma, definitely not in clinical practice. Um, it is. It's very interesting. Um, it's very interesting technology, and I think it will. At the moment, I think it's most useful for understanding the pathogenesis of glaucoma. I think okay. it's, it's very interesting looking in people who are progressing with seemingly normal pressure in normal tension glaucoma, but it's a research tool. It, um, you know, most of the studies, that there are studies that have looked at the area under the curve for you know, vessel density on OCTA, and it is not as good as the um, conventional OCT parameters. Great, thank you. Um, so this is a question that always comes up when I'm on my travels and at exhibitions doing training and things. Um, so how would an ophthalmologist react to a referral based on a definite and reliable downward trend in RNFL thickness if IOP's fields are, and, uh, are all acceptable? I think the answer is it depends on your ophthalmologist. And there <laughs> are there are certainly and, and also I think you know, it depends on your local referral practice as well. Um, so I think it is worth asking that question to the person you refer to, to have, having an understanding with your you know, hospital eye service, whether they want to see patients like that, because there's arguments for and against. And I think at the moment, um, it also depends on your own confidence in managing that patient. And you know, if, if that person is a 90 year old, then I don't think there's many glaucoma specialists that want to be referred 90 year olds with normal visual fields. Whereas if that person yes. is 40, um, then I, I would want to see that person. It does. I mean, it does depend on the rate. It does. Um, and again, that I'm I'm talking in terms of normal situation at the moment. Um, you know, we're trying to keep people out of hospital. Referral pathways are changing, and um, you know, certainly you know, David Crabb's group have shown that they've, they've looked at um, the, the, you know, what 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 are the factors that predict blindness and visual impairment in, in glaucoma patients. And, and the main one is being referred with a mean deviation of worse than minus six. So, so I think, I think we, we sometimes with OCT, the focus is on earlier diagnosis. But I, I do think OCT, uh, earlier diagnosis is, I think, I think we should rephrase it. I think it should be avoiding late diagnosis. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's a slight difference. And I do think OCT can help us avoid late diagnosis as well. Um, 
by because it's quick to perform. It, um, it's um, you know, patients patients don't like having visual fields, um, and um, so th I think there is a role for OCT in avoiding late diagnosis. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's a good that's a good answer. Thank you. Um, actually, again, you've you've slightly glanced on on the next question I have, and again. Um, to David Crab out there, if you can hear me asking this question, maybe he should cover his ears. But oh. someone has just simply asked, can a glaucoma clinic be run without doing a visual field? That's a question we've had to, we never thought we'd have to ask that, but we haven't actually <laughs> had to ask that over the last three, four months. Um, yeah. So, um, and we found the answer is yes, but is it best for patients? I, probably not. Um, I, think, um, I think the answer is no. Um, there is, OCT cannot replace visual fields at the moment. Um, yeah. I think in in you know early disease, it's very very useful. The, I think the biggest problem with OCT is the floor effect. And if, if it happens, if if the floor the average floor in RNFL is minus fifteen decibels, that's a big problem if you're relying on you know using average thickness to detect progression. That's a big yeah. problem. But there is of course a floor in visual fields as well. And uh, you know we see patients who have uh, mean deviation of the minus 28 to um, still have 6-6 six, six vision and um, you know the only way you have to monitor progression is to ask the patient you know, do you feel like you're getting worse so th there is a flaw in all of our tests um, and I think um, you know when we when we're talking about the flaw in OCT we often concentrate on RNFL and one of the one of the interesting things is you know could could something like OCT angiography actually give us a lower floor um, and and also the floor is lower. If you if you just look at the the average, you, you you hit the floor before you. There's still tissue there. So so even in advanced disease, if you take an OCT, you can see neural tissue and you can see if it's changing. So, so it is still useful, but not no no. I think the answer is no. It can't basically it can't they can't replace visual fields. Not not in not in the clinic. It's a, it's a, it's a supplement. Okay, it's a supplement. And so I, I suppose that answers the question on, on how you feel about the HUD report then. It's, it's still an early day thing, isn't it? And um, presumably it's, it still needs to stand the test of time before we can uh, say anything like that. Okay. Well, I, think, um, I, think the report, I think the HUD report is fantastic, actually. And um, I think, I think um, there, there are things, when you, when you think, the good thing about the HUD report is it's, you know, it's very simple. It's actually things that we should have done when OCT was first developed. It, 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 um, no, it's always a sign of a good idea when it's, when it's a basic thing that just I've hasn't been before. Um, so, you know, something simple like having the, the temporal RNFL in the center of the picture um, is really important. And the other thing that um, Don, Don uh, Hood has emphasized is um, that, you know, we, we tend to just look at uh, uh, one image and we don't scan through and look at the entire image. And you know, if, if we were a radiologist, we wouldn't just look at a printout of an MRI of a brain. You know, we that would just be negligence. We have to we have to look at the whole scan. It gives us so much more information. And and so I think yeah, I think the Hood report is great actually. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good, good. Um, okay. So another question: If a patient has glaucoma in one eye, what is the risk they will have glaucoma in the other eye? I'm sorry for well, that. No, well, it depends on the type of glaucoma. Um, there are some types of glaucoma which tend to be unilateral, um, but um, you no, know, certainly if you see somebody, if you see somebody who's got very severe unilateral glaucoma, firstly think, is it glaucoma? There's a high, you no, know, there is, there is a high chance that could be another type of optic neuropathy, you know, compressive lesion, something else. So always think is like glaucoma, and then secondly, look for things that would cause unilateral glaucoma, like pseudo exfoliation. Um, okay. So um, there's often a large amount of asymmetry. Um, so the, the, the answer is there's not really an easy answer to that question because it does depend on the type of glaucoma that person has. But the short answer is if it's primary open and angle glaucoma, it is highly likely uh, that person would develop in glaucoma in the other eye. Almost certain. So um, we've had a lot of questions, Andrew. And again, this always comes up when we're talking about OCT and normative data about myopic eyes. Um, and I mm. think in, in actually... To answer all of the people who asked those questions, you did actually cover this in your in your talk. You said something very important where you said that although with um, without a, norm, a, a myopic normative database, you still use the OCT as a baseline measurement and then the patient as their own control going forward. 
Is that yeah. what you would suggest then with, with myopic yeah, patients? I, yeah, I think my two tips for myopic patients is um, do a macular OCT because the macular often isn't yeah. that abnormal. And then also, yes, use them as then own, look for change over time. Look for change over time. Um, it, and unfortunately, OCT struggles where we struggle. OCT does really well in the eyes where we look and, you know, with our, with our Volk lens, we can say that's glaucoma or not glaucoma. OCT does really well there. Mm -hmm. It does struggle a little bit more in the eyes we struggle with. But what it does, I think, is it gives us an objective way and a way to quantify change over time. And, and when, we, when we look back at the, you know, what is the definition of glaucoma, it's a progressive optic neuropathy. And so you know, to yeah. diagnose it, we need to see progression. And how do we do that by, you know, if we take a photograph and compare it to another photograph, fine, but it's not, it's not quantitative and it's not really very objective. So that, I think that's one of the real things. I, would, I, wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't sort of stop doing OCT in someone with high myopia because they, the normative database isn't suitable for them, no. Yeah, and you, you did mention this several times throughout your, your presentation there that you shouldn't um, live or die by your normative database. And I'm really glad you said that because that's something we always say uh, in the academy with our training as well. It's, it's you should always be very careful with that information that it's just a guide, isn't it, uh, when you're looking at these images. Um, and I think it's also, also um, it's, it's good to know who is in the normative database because yeah. you want when you have a patient in front of you, you want to be able to say, well, how close are you to the normative database? Does it really apply? Yeah, so there's a, again, that's a really good point. And one of your slides wonderfully showed all the different manufacturers and all their different normative data sets. Because again, that's a question we're, we're always we're always getting as well. Okay, so um, sorry, Andrew. Yeah, sorry. What was I'll that? Just, the normative databases are improving all the time. So, and oh, yeah. I don't. I suspect there will be a myopic normative database in the future. Yeah, I've always. Uh, longed for a normative database that grows itself to the to the surrounding yeah. patients that feed into yeah. it and maybe we'll find a wonderful day in the future yeah. where something with AI or something like that uh, uh, develops. Okay so I'm just conscious of the time now Andrew and I don't want to take up any more of your evening but um, I just want to on behalf of everyone here just thank you so much for your brilliant talk. As always really clear, concise, um, nice, easy to understand uh, lecture. So, so thank you once again. Um, for all of you that are still uh, here, just so you know, on the um, go to webinar panel, there is actually a handout, which is our glaucoma toolkit, which Emily put together. That's a fantastic uh, document that just really shows you all different OCT parameters that Andrew's been talking about this evening. So you can actually just download that from the go to uh, webinar thing. But if you do need uh, uh, the link sending to you, we, we can send that. And we did get asked this a lot throughout Andrew's, Andrew's presentation. This uh, session has been recorded and it will be available on our website in due course. And you're all going to get a follow up email uh, from Emily confirming that. So once again, Andrew, just thank you so much for all your time and your expertise. And um, thank you. No, thanks very much, Jim. Thanks everyone for tuning in as well. Thank you. Great. Brilliant. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for joining us.